This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Thank you all for joining us this uh, afternoon and welcome to the Chancellor's Colloquium. Um, we, we've been here together many other um, instances when we had uh, visitors this past year and a half and I have to say that uh, uh, this is a great opportunity for our campus to come together and hear from very renowned leaders and scholars in various fields. It has given us an opportunity to um, be engaged in a conversation about issues which are very important to us uh, specifically, but also to higher education more generally. Personally, and I have heard from many others, uh, these uh, seminars and these um, speakers have provided a point of view that is uh, very important to us to hear. Of course, it's a point of view that comes from other uh, campuses or from other organizations, and it is a point of view that can be debated at times or be embraced immediately, but it does give us an opportunity to uh, speak our minds and have a, a discussion about issues which are very important, obviously, to us in general, but also uh, today, in today's environment more specifically. Um, we had um, a, we, we were um, very lucky, I should say, to have speakers that came from a very broad range of disciplines. And this past year, we covered uh, food, agriculture in general, but we also spoke about world economics and biochemistry. So we've had the opportunity last year, as a matter of fact, we spoke about um, the university in general, higher education in general, we covered those topics as well. And we have many more interesting topics to come. But the individuals who, who come to participate in this colloquium, they share with us their point of view about um, the public research university and uh, also the role of the public research university in addressing today's biggest challenges and needs and opportunities as well. Uh, for us, this is very important as we are trying to implement our vision of excellence. This is a framework that we created last year that articulates our vision, a vision for UC Davis, in which we see ourselves as becoming a recognized leader in innovation at the intersections of the world's most challenging issues, and that is food, water, health, society, energy, and the environment. And we also see ourselves um, through the education we provide to our students, through the intellectual contributions we make, and through our efforts to translate the knowledge that we create into products and services, that we become a major partner in economic development in the region, in the state, and in the nation. So in the context of that framework that we have developed for ourselves, it is a great honor to have with us today the economist, business professor, and presidential advisor, Dr. Laura Tyson. Dr. Tyson is professor of global management in the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. She's also currently a member of President Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. She served in the Clinton administration and was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and the President's National Economic Advisor. Laura is here to talk to us today about the future, the global economy, and its recovery. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Dr. Laura Tyson. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I've been a very long time citizen of the University of California. It's been very good to me in my life. It's allowed me to have a wonderful academic career, and occasionally it's allowed me to go off and advise presidents and come back and go off and head uh, business schools in other countries and come back. So it's a very important part 
of my life, and I'm honored to be here uh, on this campus to celebrate uh, the University of California, particularly during these uh, very difficult budgetary times. So I have about 20 minutes, and I'm going to try to do two things. One is I will talk a little bit about the global recovery and what's widely called the two-track recovery, that is the slow recovery in the developed countries and their very rapid recovery in the emerging markets. And then I want to spend maybe the last 10 minutes talking about the special challenges that confront uh, the U.S. economy as it struggles slowly to emerge from uh, the recession. So the first part, the two-track, uh, I think it's important just to uh, do a moment on history here and to recognize that in the fall of, of 2008, not even 3,000, uh, 3, not even three years ago, there was really widespread concern in my profession that we were plummeting at a rather a, a very uh, scary rate into a global depression. If you looked at that time at declines in global output, decide, declines in global equity values, declines in global trade, you couldn't see anything as severe unless you went back to the 1920s. And in fact, in some cases, the declines were even more dramatic than they were in 1929, 1930, 1931. So this was really scary stuff. Uh, and it was global. That is, it may have started uh, in the subprime market in the United States. But one of the accomplishments of the global economy uh, in 2005 or so was that we hit a high watermark in terms of linkages among countries in economics. Whether you looked at capital flows, or you looked at trade flows, or you looked at the flow of ideas, the integration of the global economy was stronger than it had ever been. We had surpassed any other level of integration. And by the way, we were celebrating that in 2005 and 2006. This was really great. Every part of the world was growing. There was growth in Africa. There was growth in the Middle East. There was growth in uh, throughout Asia. It was widely shared globalization-driven prosperity. And in fact, there was also this wonderful thing going on, which was not only was the world economy growing together, but the global inflation rate was coming down. And it looked like we were in what was then called a world of great moderation. Uh, we weren't going to have volatility so much anymore. Now, there was, however, a danger. There was a danger signal, which many economists picked up. And that is what I would call the disappearance of risk in the pricing of financial assets. So normally, you look at returns on assets, and there are some riskier than others. And you expect you're going to see a risk premium, different kinds of returns on different kinds of risk. Those risk premia seemed to just disappear. No one seemed to be paying attention to risk. There was a great complacency about risk. You embraced risky things because there was also this tremendous uh, search for yield. I don't know if any of you remember this, but endowment funds were looking for yields, and sovereign wealth funds were looking for yields, and pension funds were looking for yields. And attractive yields returns seem to be in the securitization of US real estate. So we attracted a lot of money from around the world uh, into the securities backed by US real estate. I, I want to start here because I want to say that that wonderful globalization that we were all experiencing was built on a couple of very significant imbalances. And one imbalance was in the US. Uh, because we could borrow so freely from the rest of the world at very, very attractive uh, interest rates, we went on a kind of, uh, let's put it, dis-saving dis spree. American households just drove their savings rate on average to just about zero. That We hadn't seen that since the Great Depression either. Uh, and the American government went from a surplus to a deficit. We voted ourselves a tax cut. We engaged in two wars. And we put a, a nice new Medicare drug benefit without any financing into law. So we, uh, we were, our imbalance was we were not saving enough. We were spending more than we were earning. And luckily for us, there was a whole a group of other countries headed by China that were actually doing the exact opposite. 
They were producing and earning much more than they were spending. They were taking the surplus that they had and investing it in the U.S. in very uh, intricate ways. But a lot of the investment just went into U.S. Uh, Treasury securities. So when Alan Greenspan, uh, and he was still the, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve, decided that it was time to try to cool off the U.S. economy by raising interest rates, he couldn't do it. He kept raising the interest rate at the bottom, but the interest rate at the top was coming down, wasn't going anyplace because this glut, it was called a savings glut, of money was coming into the U.S. So we had globalization, great interdependence, built on imbalances. When the housing market started to soften in the United States and the Im imbalances were exposed, um, it didn't take much for a very tightly linked global economy to face a common set of problems, and that is a sort of run on the financial institutions, I would say a run on the banking system as opposed to a run on banks, uh, and a tremendous loss in uh, in wealth as the subprime mortgages brought down whole classes of securitized assets, causing huge losses in wealth uh, for individual households, companies, and banks. So that's kind of how we got into this. Now, it turns out that history has a lot to say about such kinds of crises. And it says where the crises begin, that is where you have a housing market crisis that causing a financial market crisis, and that's built on high degree of leverage. Because remember, everybody was complacent, so they were taking on a lot of debt, a lot of leverage, okay? When you have that, the recession that follows is going to be pretty nasty, and it's going to take a long time to get out of because you've got to deleverage. American households have got to bring their debt down. Do you know that debt in the United States for households has not come down that much? It's come down 3 or 4%. The savings rate has gone up quite a lot from zero to about five, but you know what? 5% savings rate of households is not enough. Um, to deal with the savings that one needs for housing, for pensions, for health, for education. So we're in this very painful deleveraging uh, recovery, balance sheet recovery. And the prediction of history would be that it takes a while. The prediction of, also, of history would also be that in the process of the recession and of saving the financial system, the government is going to have to significantly increase its debt. Actually, history suggests double its debt, double its debt. Because the government is basically trying to do two things at once. It's trying to help uh, basically shore up through things like the, the TARP, the Trouble Asset Recovery Program. It's trying to shore up the banking systems uh, institutions. It is also trying to encourage uh, spending through tax relief, through building infrastructure, through grants through the Department of Energy, through a whole stimulus package. That, that's very predictable. The government debt goes up. But the recovery is slow. The recovery is slow. And whether you tell that story in the US where the recession was the longest and deepest, or you tell it in England, I could tell a similar story in England, or you tell it throughout continental Europe, variations but the same story. So you plummet into a recession, and then you only slowly come out. Slow, slow. The emerging markets, and this is a two track, they were kind of pulled in by us. They actually had, they didn't have a housing crisis. They had, their banks were pretty well capitalized. They had made some bad investments in the U.S., but they didn't have a, uh, they, they started from a strong place. And by the way, they were also growing more quickly than the U.S. was or than Europe was anyway. So what's happened here is they've come out really fast. In fact, some, you'd say, whereas output levels actually fell, in the developed countries, including the United States, it wasn't just that the growth rate slowed down, output fell below capacity. In the emerging market countries, it just slowed down. It slowed down in most of them, and then it accelerated right back up. So the two track is, reflects two things. Number one, the crisis didn't start in the emerging markets. They had a stronger beginning position. They had excess savings. They had good reserves. They had uh, fiscal situations which were sounder. They were growing faster anyway. 
because of population growth, because of technological improvements. So they come out fast. Uh, the developed countries, and certainly where the original crisis started, subprime here, and even subprime in California, you could understand that the recovery is uh, much uh, slower. So this is the f first time since, uh, the, really the first time, uh, that the U.S. has not been the engine of the world economy's recovery. Actually, the engine has been a group of emerging market countries. And the U.S. has benefited from this, by the way, because one, when uh, the U.S., uh, when companies in the U.S., uh, see that demand for their products in Asia are growing, they can invest more in the U.S. and produce uh, more in the U.S. and hire more in the U.S. So one of the benefits to the U.S. right now is that the pull of products through exports to the emerging markets. So that, that's a little bit of the story of two track. I do want to spend some time talking about the special issues uh, that confront the U.S. right now, and I'd like to do it by having you think about three different kinds of deficits that the U.S. faces. I will distinguish the jobs deficit from the fiscal deficit from the growth deficit. And I think it's important to make those distinctions because they have different implications for what policy needs to be. So if we start with the jobs deficit, uh, the unemployment numbers sort of give you a sense of the jobs deficit. So the unemployment rate, in its, it will come out again, I think, this week. Uh, the last time it was fell below 9%. It's 8.9%. But... We have had, as a consequence of very poor job growth for several years now, a large number of people are simply not in the labor market at all right now. So the job problem is actually, the missing jobs, the jobs deficit, is actually bigger than the unemployment rate would tell you it is. So I, the numbers I hear, we have 7.5 million fewer jobs than the pre-recession peak, 13.7 million Americans unemployed, 8.3 million employed part-time when they would want to be employed full-time. 4 million have left the workforce altogether. So the estimate is right now, if we wanted to uh, fill the jobs gap, so the jobs gap, what is it? Maybe one measure of it is if we created enough jobs to get back to where we were at the peak, uh, in, in 2007, and then we actually also created enough jobs for all of the individuals who have been added to the labor force since then. Uh, we would say you need something like 200,000 jobs a month, and even at 200,000 jobs a month, we're not anywhere near that at this point, it would take about six to seven years to fill the jobs gap. From now, from right now, it would take uh, uh, six to seven years to just get back to a kind of measure of full employment. That's a very big jobs gap or jobs deficit. Uh, now, why? We, we had this discussion. Uh, why does it exist? What, 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 what happened here? I think, first of all, you just have to under, uh, understand that a lot of this has to do with the collapse in demand. So think about the economy. It's going along. It has a certain ability to supply goods and services at full employment. Say full employment is 5%, 4 to 5%, because you've got to worry about people moving in and out of the labor force, changing jobs. So let's say full employment is about 4 to 5%. If the economy is running at its normal capacity, that's the unemployment rate. But when we had a collapse in wealth, when we had households starting to reduce their debt and save more, when we had uh, businesses not being able to borrow to invest because the financial system was in serious trouble, all the demand for goods and services, whether it came from investors making physical capital investments or households making expenditures, all that demand slowed down dramatically. So we're not running as much demand growth as we need for the supply growth we have. That's the basic recession recovery problem. And um, I would say that the pace of recovery is just not fast enough to make progress on creating, uh, reducing the jobs gap at a very rapid rate. You need about 2.5% growth just to generate enough jobs to absorb the increase in the labor force. But we already have 
8.9% unemployment. So we have to do better than just absorb the increase in the unemployment rate. But it's very hard to see the economy growing significantly more than 25 to 3%. And that's the problem. Now, that isn't the only problem, because if you look at the economy going into the recession, if you look at the period 2001 to 2007, uh, from the end, end of the dot-com recession to the beginning of this recession. The economy only created 6 million jobs. This was actually very poor performance by the standards of the 1990s, the 1980s, 1970s. We have, we, we have run into, uh, in, in the US economy, a problem with job creation. Now, I'm going to just talk two aspects of this. One is we do have, um, through uh, both globalization, but even more through technology, we do have significantly skill-biased technological change, which is actually undermining uh, certain kinds of jobs in the United States, including manufacturing jobs. So that's, we, that is a, that's an ongoing issue that the recession was built on top of. And then second of all, we have what's called the polarization of the labor force going on. That is, you, our technology and our competitive position globally means we're creating jobs uh, at the top in the skill distribution. We are also creating jobs at the bottom in the skill distribution, and we are undermining jobs in the middle of the skill distribution. So when somebody asked me uh, at, at our conversation before this, was I worried about jobs in the United States long term, I said, I'm worried about the quality of jobs in the United States long term. I think the economy will recover, it's painful, but I'm not sure we end up with a job mix in terms of wages and benefits and that we can be proud of. And I think this is a big issue for us. So I would put the jobs deficit as not just the job, missing jobs because we hit a big recession and a slow recovery, it's the missing good jobs that are coming because of a mismatch between the skill requirements of the jobs of the future and the education we have, but also because the technology is actually taking out jobs in the middle, and that's a disturbing trend. So that's what I'll say about the jobs deficit. Let me turn to the fiscal deficit. That's one you probably hear a lot about now. And uh, all I really want to do now is give you some uh, principles to think about in terms of the fiscal deficit. First of all, uh, to start with, what should the goal of deficit reduction be? So uh, as you're reading things and hearing the debate, I think the first goal should be to uh, make sure that the government's debt is not growing faster than the economy. And this is a problem for us right now. The government's debt is growing faster than the economy. And even all the budget plans uh, that the president has put forward or the Congress have put forward so far, the government debt continues to grow faster than the economy. So take as the goal, let's just stabilize the debt growth relative to the output growth. That, by the way, doesn't suggest that you need to have a balanced budget. That's a good news, OK, because we're pretty far from that, OK? If you got to a deficit of around 3% of GDP, that would be enough. That would be enough. That get you there. That's a good, good starting place, OK? So I'd say, first, start with that. Second, you have to start with the view that right now the economy is still pretty weak. The economy is being supported right now by a huge amount of monetary support from the Fed and fiscal support from the government. Now, you might say, but the stimulus package is over. Yeah, but at the end of 2010, we passed another round of tax cuts. This year, the tax revenue as a share of GDP in the United States is probably going to be as low as 15%. We haven't seen a level like that as low in any time since uh, on record, really. So 15% of GDP as coming in as revenues, because we've cut taxes to support the economy. 24% of GDP on spending, because we have been spending a fair amount of government money to support the economy. That's a budget deficit of uh, 9%. You can't stick around with that for very long. Uh, but if you try to undo it really fast, you do run the risk 
that you pull out support for the economy. So when the, the state, uh, when a state like California or the federal government says, we are, if it says, we are going to cut uh, spending by 1% of GDP, something like that, that's 1% of GDP reduction in demand, okay? I told you we don't have enough demand right now for the supply, so you're gonna have to worry about the effects of that. So most economists, and I would say this is true uh, across the political spectrum, most economists think we should have serious deficit reduction to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio at around, so a deficit of around 3%, and we should do that very gradually. If you look at the, uh, the Simpson-Bowles report, proposal, which came out of the president's uh, fiscal commission, it included both Democrats and Republicans. They said something exactly like that. Let's set a goal. The goal is to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio around 2000, uh, 2015, and we'll do that uh, by putting in a plan now that will gradually take place as the economy recovers. So that's a very important fiscal deficit uh, principle. I'll give you a couple others, and then I want to turn to growth deficit. Um, on deficit reduction, I think it's very important to understand the realities of the budget that we actually face at the federal level. So the most important numbers I think here are um, on the spending side. This is how the government, the federal government budget looks. 20% on defense and security. 21% on health, that's Medicare, Medicaid, and the children's health programs, 20% on Social Security, 6% interest on the debt, 14% safety net programs that are dedicated or directed to mainly low-income households and individuals, uh, about 7% for veterans and uh, federal government retirees. That leaves 12% for everything else. And it's only the 12% right now that is being discussed. Only the 12%, okay? So everything that you can think about that the government might do, whether it's collect your taxes, help build a road, run the judiciary, uh, those things are all in the 12%. So I only raise that because, again, what you need to look for in the fiscal deficit solutions are solutions that look at all aspects of spending. There isn't a way to deal with the fiscal deficit problem without looking at all aspects of spending. And so I would urge you to, to do that. Right now, what we're discussing in, the, in terms of will there be a government shutdown or not has nothing to do with these things. It's basically about the 12% and things to cut in the 12%. At the same time, I would also say I don't see how one um, gets a credible deficit reduction plan without having uh, an increase in revenues. And I will only say there that my own view of this, there are lots of ways you could do this, get an increase in revenues. One is simply go back to the tax rates of the Clinton administration. Clinton administration wasn't such a bad deal for the US economy. It was the longest and strongest economic expansion in the post-World War II period. The deficit would be cut in half by 2020 if we simply let the tax cuts that were introduced at the beginning of 2000, 2001, if we let them expire at the end of 2012. So one thing is just go back to tax rates we had in the 1990s, not such a bad decade for the US economy. Another thing would be to uh, have a, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Commission suggested that the US should consider adding a value added tax. And uh, that would be a small value added tax of five to 6% could actually go a quite a long way to getting us down in terms of credible deficit positions. I will just say that in general, I think revenues need to be part of this and we can debate that in the, in the discussion. Uh, one other guideline I think is very important before I get to the growth deficit is distributional concerns. Because we should not forget that the distribution of income and wealth in the United States have become increasingly uneven over time. My colleague Robert Reich points out on a regular basis we have never had such unequal income and wealth distribution in the United States except in 1928. That was the last time we saw these kinds of figures. So we've had increasing distribution unevenness 
And of course, we don't have, relative to the other advanced industrial countries, very generous retirement or health care systems. So one might want to say, as you put together the spending cuts and the revenue increases, let's look at least to protect those most in need. Let's move to more means testing, perhaps, of our programs, but let's make sure we do some means testing. The final thing gets me to the growth deficit. So I've talked a little bit about the jobs deficit. I've talked about the fiscal deficit, the growth deficit. I really do worry that not only is the US having a slow recovery for reasons to do with deleveraging and debt and needing to rebuild, but we may have a slow growth trajectory going forward as well because our labor force isn't going to be growing as fast as it did in the 50s, 60s, 70s. We, we have a sl different demographics. We have to rely much more on productivity growth for growth. Where does productivity growth come from? What are the sources of productivity growth? And how can the government enhance productivity growth? Can it? Um, I think that the answer, again, comes from history and comes from cross-country comparisons, economic development studies. There are certain kinds of investments that are critical, that are public investments, that help enhance the productivity of the private sector. And they fall in essentially three areas, research, education, and infrastructure. If you look at the federal government of the United States, two things are true. Number one, all of those areas are in the non-defense discretionary area, that little 12% that everybody's going after right now. Okay, They're all there. They're not in defense. They're not in Social Security. They're not in Medicare. Okay, So education is about 3% of the federal budget. Scientific and medical research is about 2% and transportation infrastructure is about 3%. And there are numerous studies which would support the view that these kinds of government investments can enhance productivity. So if you're worried about the long run need to rely more on productivity for growth, and you're worried about how fast can we pull out of this recession uh, and recovery into faster growth, you need to worry about these areas of spending and how much the country is willing to invest in them. These are obviously very important for universities, like the University of California at Davis, the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, it's why when the president um, spoke in the State of the Union address, he said, he talked about the need for fiscal austerity, but he also talked about the need to out-innovate, out-invest, out-educate, out-research uh, the rest of the world. Um, let me just say a little bit about research, because I, I know I'm using more time than I should. Here's some good news. The US currently spends about a third, a little less than a third of all R&D spending in the world occurs in the United States. The U.S. only has about 5% of the global population. It only has about 20% of the global production base. So that's pretty good. We are spending a fair amount. On the other hand, it is really true that our funding for basic research is primarily being supported by the federal government. And the federal government, uh, the federal funding for R&D as a fraction of GDP has declined by 60% over the past 40 years. One estimate I've seen recently is if we, wanted to if we wanted to restore federal support for basic science to its 1987 level as a share of GDP, the government would have to be spending $60 billion more each year. That's the current budget is, I think, something like $138 billion. So this is a very substantial missing amount of money. So, I think in all of these fiscal discussions, we have to worry about what happens to the research budget, because that is the seed grain for innovation. And that research budget and seed grain then plays into development and commercialization, which gets back to growth and back to jobs and back to good jobs. So research is very, very uh, important. The research and development tax credit. So we have a system now in the United States where about a third of the research is done by the federal government support, and that is primarily basic research. Two thirds is done by the commercial sector, and that is done with a significant amount of research and development tax credit support. That's why the president has asked that that support 
be retained and that it be made more generous. Other countries around the world are competing with us. They're introducing even more generous research credits. They're saying, come bring your research here, bring your scholars here, bring your plant and equipment here. We'll give you really good uh, tax breaks. So I would say watch for, and you're thinking about the growth deficit and the fiscal deficit, watch for what happens to R&D. Tax credit, watch what happens to basic science. The two other areas I would say you, you need to think about here are education. And again, um, this is something I don't need to spend much time on with this audience, but uh, every dollar that the government uh, can spend effectively, I underscore that, what the, what the administration's doing, remember it's only 3% of the federal budget. Education in the United States is not a federal uh, mission except in certain areas. They're focusing on STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, both at the uh, K through 12 level and at the uh, university level. They are focusing on Pell Grants and loans and tax credits to support students to get a college and a post-college education. So that's really where the focus uh, of the federal government can be and should be. And then finally, I would just uh, mention infrastructure at the end. Um, I've been working a lot, I worked a lot with the uh, President's Commission last year on the concept of a national infrastructure bank. The U.S. actually uh, invests in its infrastructure now as much in real dollars as it did in 1968. And it's a lot bigger economy now. And uh, you can simply by taking uh, various trips around the world find much better infrastructure uh, than exists in many parts of the United States. And American companies say that one of the things that affects their location decisions is the port structure, the airport structure, the road structure, the, tra the, the rail line structure that they are dealing with. Infrastructure investment is... Uh, wonderful in two ways. It has an immediate effect on creating jobs. So basically, people who are put to work on infrastructure are put to work now, today. Uh, and of course, right now, the challenge is that state and local governments who finance a lot of this don't have the financing capability to do it. So those people are not being put to work. But infrastructure is also a form of investment. People are put to work today on developing an improved infrastructure for tomorrow, and that generates growth and competitiveness. Now, let me just end with, there, a few years ago, there was a very influential report um, called The Gathering Storm. It was done by the National Academy of Engineers and Sciences. It laid out this set of challenges. It said, and this was before the financial crisis, so these arguments have only become more, I would say, more true, truer. Okay, what they said was the U.S. Uh, is suffering from insufficient investment in research, in infrastructure, and in, particularly in education at all levels, and that as a consequence of this, U.S. long-run growth is uh, under uh, duress, and that the rest of the world is uh, out investing us in all of these areas, and this will erode our competitive advantage and ultimately erode our living standards. That warning came before the financial crisis. The financial crisis, I think, has underscored the warning. But sadly, as they observed in a recent report, almost none of their recommendations have been put into place. And now the fiscal situation makes it even less likely that they will be put into place unless, unless um, Americans recognize the importance of investing in their future and say, as we make some of the really tough choices about cutting defense or, or cutting uh, Medicare or adjusting Social Security, as we make these really tough choices, we better worry about investing in our future growth through these kinds of uh, investments. These kinds of investments are very important to universities, but I'm not making these arguments as special pleading for universities. I'm making them as special pleading for the U.S. economy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very um, interesting um, talk, I would say very important to us. Um, I wanted to add that very recently I saw a report by the EU, mm -hmm. um, specifically uh, focusing on higher education, and mm -hmm. they looked at data they had in the last 10 years, and they said for every 1% 
of the population that has access to higher education, mm -hmm. the economy grows by 0.7 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and so percent. So it's, um, it was very interesting, at least for them, yes, for their yes, data. Yes. Um, at this point, what we'll do is what we did last time, and I think it's working very well because it gives us, is giving us an opportunity to have a discussion uh, that focuses on the uh, specific um, issues and ideas that have been discussed during the presentation, the speech, is to have a panel. And uh, today, our, first of all, I'll start with the moderator, who is uh, Steve Corral. Mm -hmm. And Steve, as we all know, is our dean of uh, the Graduate School of Management and a professor of management. And we have two other panel members, uh, two of our uh, very well uh, known and distinguished faculty members in the uh, Graduate School of Management is Professor Brad Barber, who is the Maurice J. and Marcia G. Gallagher, Chair in Finance, and the director of the UC Davis Center for Investor Welfare and Corporate Responsibility. And the other one is Professor Robert Finstra, who is the C. Brian Cameron Distinguished Chair in International Economics and the Director of the UC Davis Center for International Data and also the Director of the International Trade and Investment Program for the National Bureau of Economic Research. So I would like to ask them to come forward. Um, so we will um, have the panel um, have their discussion, and then I will ask uh, Steve Corral to also do the Q&A that will follow this one. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Chancellor. It's really a, a privilege to participate in this event, and thank you for uh, holding these colloquia events that you have that contribute uh, greatly to the intellectual fabric of, of our campus. And so today we're talking about uh, economic recovery, economic development issues. So uh, my role is to orchestrate a dialogue among uh, professors Tyson, Barber, and Feenstra. Uh, and I may add a few comment of, <laughs> comments of myself here and there as well. Um, and then uh, around 5 o'clock, then we will turn to inviting you for your comments. So I'd urge you to begin to think about what uh, what comments or questions uh, you would like to ask Professor Tyson or the panel. So uh, let me begin with uh, Professor Feenstra and, and uh, ask him to comment uh, on the following. Uh, Professor Tyson talked a lot about uh, interdependencies and linkages among economies and among uh, financial institutions. So Rob, what does is, what is your research tell you about the role of interdependencies in international trade mm -hmm. and uh, how trade, what, what role uh, trade plays in the economic recovery? First, let me thank uh, Laura for her talk, uh, which I agree with fully. Uh, and I'm happy to sort of highlight the role of global linkages. First, uh, Laura started um, by going a little back in history a few years and then comparing it uh, to many years ago to the recession in the U.S. Let me just go back 15 years to 1996. And that was a watershed year in the global economy because of the Asian crisis. This was an exchange rate and a financial crisis in the Asian countries, which really barely touched us. Uh, we at that time were coming out of the recession of the early 90s, and, and here at the University of California, we're just coming out of the three rounds of voluntary early retirements and planning for our growth after that. So uh, unless you focus on Asia in your own reading, you might not remember the Asia crisis. What happened as a result of that is the Asian countries actually, um, they were caught with foreign exchange reserves that were much too low that exacerbated the whole crisis. And they learned from that and accumulated reserves. And this was part of the, the savings glut that Dr. Tyson referred to. Uh, but as a result of that, that is really, in my mind, one of the reasons that they came out so well from the current crisis, that they were relatively unscathed. So they learned from their mistakes. And they developed these war chests, as they're sometimes called, or a, a large set of reserves. So it's sort of a, a positive lesson they took for, from a previous error, if you like, uh, and that really, really served them well in, in these last two years. So that's sort of one positive linkage for them. And if I could just continue briefly and jump to the end of Dr. Tyson's talk uh, to the US, um, where she was talking about productivity growth and the sources of productivity growth. 
and she listed research, education, and infrastructure. And there again on that list, I'd want to add international trade. International trade can be an important source of productivity growth, including for the United States. And I'll just give one example that does come from my own research. And that's a, a program of the World Trade Organization called the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement, which basically eliminated tariffs worldwide on high-tech products. And this started in 1997 by, by sort of coincidence. And then by about 2000, 2001, those tariffs were eliminated. And my own research shows that even for the United States, uh, this program of tariff reduction explained about 20% of the productivity pickup we had in the United States from 1997 onwards. And remember, you have to put yourself back. This is when computers had first entered the workforce. Uh, and we did see a productivity pickup in the second half of the 90s. And some part of that, 20% by my estimate, was really due to this international trade, a very positive effect of international trade. Mm -hmm. So uh, both these cases are sort of positive examples, which is what international trade economists like to give, right? Positive <laughs> examples of, of international trade. And let me leave it at that for now. OK. Laura, do you, your responses or your thoughts about the role of trade? I, I completely agree that, that, that trade is uh, productivity enhancing. And I think the evidence on that is, is overwhelming. I, when I did education uh, research and infrastructure, I was really talking about parts of the federal budget. But, but I certainly completely uh, support the notion of continue to try to uh, promote and liberalize trade even further. Um, I'd be interested, but this is a question to you, and so it's unfair. I think the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement, was very important. I, I haven't seen that number, but that's great. I th I've thought for a while, why don't we try to uh, engineer something like that in green tech? That somehow or other, we have countries all around the world embracing industrial policy to build their green tech industries. And it might be a place where we could get some sectoral trade liberalization, maybe give a boost to the, to the green tech industry. So I may follow up with you on your research. <laughs> um, Brad, you and I have had many conversations about uh, finance and economics. And I've often heard you say that economists are good at thinking how to grow the economic pie, but they're not as well developed in thinking about how to divide the economic mm. pie. So I'd be interested in your. Uh, <laughs> Your thoughts about the uh, uh, your reactions to Laura's comments about savings rates, but also uh, invite you to go beyond that and share with us your thoughts about uh, Social Security issues, pensions in both the public sector and the private sector. Yeah, well, I um, thanks, Laura, very much for your thoughts. It was, uh, I think, a well laid out um, diagnosis of the problem. Um, the solution's a lot tougher, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I, I tried not to do <laughs> solutions. I figured we'd, we would disagree on right. solutions. So I feel like I've just gotten a diagnosis of cancer, and I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what my prognosis is. But um, setting aside that analogy for the moment, I th one thing I really want to pick up on is this notion of um, you know, skill-based um, dichotomy and the mm. types of jobs that are um, available to folks and you know I think we've and this this follows on the international trade issue because there's no question that international trade leads to gain the question is how those gains are shared among the citizens of the world and that you know economists I think are beginning to grapple with that issue and think about how the pie is shared there's no question inter international trade grows the pie for example but the question is how that pie is divvied up. And we see that in the US economy, where mm -hmm. you know, roughly 9% of uh, the workforce is, is out of work. There's many more millions, as Laura pointed out, who are um, out of the labor force in, entirely. And those folks are really struggling to even make ends meet, put food on the table, pay for their rent, et cetera. That's, this is a dire consequence. And at the top end, as she pointed out, um, this is Emmanuel Saez, who's at uh, Berkeley, gathers these statistics. 20% mm -hmm. of the income, roughly, slightly less than 20%, goes to the top 1% of wage earners. You know, and that's just a, a really huge concentration of wealth. Between 1950 and about 1985, that averaged about 9%. So it was co always concentrated, and you would generally expect that. But in the last 15 to 20 years, that's, that's doubled, uh, and mm -hmm. as Laura pointed out, is at, at sort of recession levels. So you know, I think that's a challenge that we as economists have to think about. I, again, am diagnosing the problem, not offering solutions. Mm -hmm. But the profession in general has focused on how to grow the pie rather than to think about issues about how, mm -hmm. how those gains can be shared by, by all. 
Um, in terms of the entitlement issue that, mm -hmm. that Laura pointed out, um, Social Security being 20%, health 20%, dev defense 20%, I'm ballparking these numbers. That's about right, though. Yeah, and um, you know, these, these are the issues that we really need to tackle, and actually some of the solutions are breathtakingly simple. Um, so for Social yeah. Security, um, which is in my wheelhouse, um, all you really need to do is increase the retirement age or the age at which folks mm -hmm. um, collect Social Security benefits to, to solve the problem. Um, it's the third rail of politics. No one's willing to sort of go there. Um, I, for one, think that a divine benefit plan like Social Security is an important part of a safety net for retirement, uh, especially when over the last generation we've hoisted that responsibility onto citizens. They now have to save in their 401k plans, which in aggregate we're failing to do miserably, as Laura pointed out. <laughs> we're also forced to manage our own portfolios, which in general we mm -hmm. don't do a really good job at. Mm -hmm. uh, my own research is on the intersection of psychology and finance, and let me say there's a lot of errors we make in, in how we manage mm -hmm. our own portfolios. Mm -hmm. And so there's really no safety net for these folks who aren't saving, or if they're saving, don't manage their portfolios well. And I think that you know we really need to tackle these issues. And I'm not a politician, but I would really like to see somebody make some headway on on preserving the safety net, but doing so in a sensible way. Or do you, responses? Well, I'm sorry I didn't offer any solutions, but I, I chose I chose not to. Um, there are, each <laughs> one is very uh, politically fraught. I completely agree with the observation. I, I agree with everything, obviously, uh, but. I think that economists particularly do tend to agree social security, <laughs> economists do. I, I made that point in my remarks that there's actually a large degree of consistency among economists across the aisle, if you will, in terms of the size of deficit reduction, the challenges. Thing. Um, but I think I would say absolutely right on the ease with which you can deal with social security. The really, really tough one. I mean, I would say if you strip everything else away, Basically, the U.S. has a two, its, its deficit problem is a two-part problem. One is demographics and health, and two is revenues, okay? We don't, we, we are running a country that is where, where we, as we showed this past couple of weeks, we still want to be the policemen of the world. We're running, um, we are, we account for a significant share of all defense spending in the world, in the United States. We want to have a system which has uh, we have a growing share of health in our government. More than half of our health care spending is now going through the government budget. Uh, health care costs rise much faster than GDP, than the cost of anything else. And until we figure out what to do about that, you cannot run an economy at a revenue to GDP rate of 20%. You can't, you can't do it. You can't do it. Ronald Reagan had revenues as a share of GDP of 22 percent, and Medicare and Medicaid and CHIPS, all those things were much, much smaller then. So basically, I would say, really strip it all away, and you got those two problems. And the, and the really depressing thing about this is there's a very good, um, he's, uh, it's, a, it's a think tank, which, is, which I will say is known for its liberal biases, but it, it is one of the very best uh, long-term budget observers of the United States around his name is Bob Greenstein. And I just read a report of his. And he says, every single thing that healthcare experts say, we know as of a year ago about what to do to slow the rate of growth of healthcare costs without, reduce, without increasing the number of the uninsured or reducing the quality of coverage is in the health care bill. And it won't even begin to slow health care costs for five to 10 years. That's the kind of situation we're in. We don't know how to slow the rate of growth of health care costs. And it's not just in the public sector. The public sector growth of health care costs is about the same as in the private sector. We have a health care cost problem in the United States, which is a major economic and political problem, and experts don't know what to do about it. And I think that's just important to recognize. So I can't give you a solution, neither can the experts. <laughs> no, we threw right. everything into this bill that could possibly be thrown in, and it's not going to take much effect. So. Laura, I have a question uh, about leadership. Uh, you're a person who has uh, occupied 
leadership roles in academe and in business and, and in government. And so I'll ask a very simple question, but I'm intending to <laughs> phrase it in a slightly provocative way. Uh -oh. Why is it that women make better leaders? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've thought a lot. I haven't thought about that question. Or I've, I've never allowed myself to pose it quite that way. I have thought over time about leadership. And I've thought that leadership is, I think, significantly about engaging others to work with you and mobilizing a team. And it's not so much about you as about the team of people who you lead. And to the extent that there are male-female differences in style, I think women may be better equipped to deal with that. I'm not the solitary sort of major general in front of the troops. Mm -hmm. I'm with the troops. The troops are us. Uh, so possibly, to the extent that you are correct. That would be my <laughs> observation. Very <laughs> diplomatically put. <laughs> OK, great. Well, let, let's have some of your questions and comments. And I'd uh, invite you to direct them to Laura or, or Brad or, or Rob. And um, so what uh, comments do you have for, if you could uh, please take a mic. How about Shannon has a question? If you could uh, stand up and identify yourself, uh, and then your question or comment. OK. I'm Shannon Anderson. I'm a professor of management at the graduate school. Um, I think most of us in the room were probably, you said you didn't give prescriptions or you didn't give solutions. <laughs> but I think we're probably all feeling part of the solution in that research and education are going to be our path forward. Right. Um, but there have been a lot of uh, allegations that were also part of the problem, and that is with respect to productivity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could give some thought or, or give us some thoughts about productivity in education, both mm -hmm. higher ed and K-12, uh, <laughs> and what we, what we need to be offering to educate more students at a, at a fair tuition rate. Well, I'm not going to even try to do the K-12 through stuff, because I, I really think that that um, is it's a problem that I don't, I haven't done any real research on, and I haven't even done that much reading about. I know we have a serious issue, but. So on, on universities, I, I think, um, I sort of start with the presumption that the cost of running research universities has really increased significantly. And it's increased significantly because the cost of doing research, whether you do it in a university lab or a uh, corporate lab or a national lab, has grown uh, significantly for all sorts of reasons. But it's been rising faster than, again, it's one of the items that rises faster than the cost of that overall CPI or consumer price index. Or like that. I think we have a lot of, uh, one of the key things I think the US must do that I didn't talk about is we do actually have to reassess the, uh, the sort of mountain of regulations, either, each one of which might have been well-intentioned, on what companies can do and what universities can do. So we face at every turn a kind of regulation which means you cannot do something a certain way which looks to be a more productive way because of a regulation. So I think that's, that's something that just as the corporate sector has requested, um, for, I'm, I sit on this presidential council, and one of the major issues that the corporate sector focuses on is let's look and see are there not some areas of regulation that were put in place maybe several years ago, and then we're built on top of and on top of and on top of to the point where no one has assessed the net effect. So I think that we need to do that in universities as well. And in, in a public university, you have both, I want to say, certainly I experienced this when I was dean, you have federal restrictions, you have state restrictions, and you have campus restrictions. And uh, at Berkeley, the campus restrictions were quite well known because we have a very powerful faculty senate. So um, I think that there are things that uh, we need to do 
better uh, in terms of uh, thinking, continuing to think about, the universities are doing this now, think about ways to enhance learning through um, technology. But I will say that one of the problems for universities is just as we are figuring out very good ways to use the technology, I, we are suffering from the fact that the students coming in, coming in from a very poor K through 12 system, we need to spend money on them in ways we shouldn't, we're, we're taking up the cost of the failure of the system feeding in the students, which I think is a, a very, so I think you have to think about this holistically. Um, so those are some of the, and then finally I would say, because I do believe this, um, different units on research university campuses obviously have different potential financial models. And I've thought about this a lot in terms of business schools. And sometimes what you have is the, the business school itself can think of a way that it can run a more efficient financial model, but then it will run into either the state restrictions or the federal restrictions or the campus restrictions. Well, why should a business school be able to do that when an English department cannot? So there's going to have to be a lot of um, of decentralization. I, I, I will t uh, tell a story which I told to, uh, you know, we, we were discussing this before and I told your dean this story. I recently was at a meeting with, on the phone with uh, Governor Brown and uh, he talked about several times the importance, uh, the need, not the importance, the need for significant cuts in the university budget. So I finally said to him, look, I'm not going to say anything about the university budget because you'll just take it as special pleading. And I'm, but I said, what I will say is I think you, if you're going to do this, you need to give the campuses, individual campuses, as much discretion as you can. They have got to figure out the way to make their model work. And he laughed and he said, that's not what I hear from the regents. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, the regents are wrong. <laughs> if there is any regent in the audience, we can talk about it later. But uh, I do think it's going to require uh, campus, individual campuses have to make efficiency decisions uh, as understanding their own campus needs and their own uh, strengths. Rob, please. So I also wanted to pitch in an answer uh, to the question about what does this mean about how we educate our students? And this gets back to something Laura mentioned in her talk about the polarization of the labor force. And as she's very aware of, uh, the workers who are gaining in, in this new century are those at the top end, and actually those at the bottom end, just with high school education, actually aren't doing too bad. But there's kind of a hollowing out in the middle. And what do we mean by the middle? So the middle is not just those earning a middle income. Labor economists have been very good at tracking characteristics of jobs, like does it require face-to-face -face communication, does it require manual dexterity, mm -hmm. or to pick a very important one, is it routine? And the workers in the middle are those that do routine jobs, because routine jobs can be sent overseas. So what does that say for us? It says we should be teaching our students something which by the time they graduate is more than routine, right? <laughs> and whether it requires face-to-face -face communication or original thinking or, or doing something with your hands, or if you're doing it on a computer, it can't just be a formula. It can't be routine. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a nice lesson there. Mm -hmm. Brad, any comments on uh, productivity in educational institutions? Well, you know, I think Laura and, and Rob really covered covered this well. Um, I do think that the university's role in this, um, in terms of gaining efficiencies and providing uh, unique skills, is really important, as as Rob pointed out. Question on this side, Wayne. Can please. I can I say one thing sure. on the on the education thing, the, playing off of what Rob said? I, I think this notion of what is not routine and the ability to be creative mm -hmm. and the ability to be analytical. It's really why I personally would, I now basically say, look, 100 years ago, the US led on high school education being the standard for everyone. I think college education has to be the standard for as many people as possible, because that's just the way the technology and the globalization work. You have a chance in the world to have a middle or high income job if you have a college education. Maybe it's not. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't mean you absolutely will, but if you don't, 
I think the, the numbers for years now have shown that you are in trouble and getting in more serious trouble over time. So, mm. please. Uh, I want to take a little different. Could you tack. identify your stand up uh, and Wayne identify Martholini? yourself? Uh, I'm a, happen to be a Berkeley graduate, pre Haas, uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to look at micro and macro. Uh -huh. uh, micro, in the sense, the area that we seem to be forgetting is small business, mm. and I have yet to see a model from. Uh, graduate schools that, that deal with upward mobility and the complexity of small business and the use of technology to put solar and all of those, not simply in infrastructure for the macro mm -hmm. sense, but the micro that is huge in terms of the ability to put people to work. And if that as an aspect of upward mobility, I see no models that are coming out of graduate schools that are focused on mobilizing uh, we have corporate uh, wealth that is into efficiencies, which will then uh, lessen the employment in some sense. It, it's possible. Uh, I don't think we're addressing where we can get multiple bangs for the bucks. We get welfare dollars. We get, we get upward mobility so that they can have a, uh, a rise and increase their productivity and deal with the massive mm -hmm. amounts of regulations. Mm -hmm. And in my own case, dealing with banks at the, at the small business end is mm -hmm. ludicrous. Mm -hmm. okay. the, I dealt with a third <coughs> of the state and put the budget together as a junior member. The complexity that I have to deal with daily to facilitate small business is by far more complicated. Mm -hmm. So small business, Laura, thoughts about that? Well, I, I certainly think uh, on the banking side, and just to say that one of the key, if you think about a, a one of the things that's held back uh, the pace of recovery, it actually has been the much uh, tougher uh, constraints on the borrowing capability of the small business sector. That, that credit market, that loan market just really closed down. And it's only now mm -hmm. that you're beginning to see signs of loan growth on net to small business, it was it, it basically the, it was a situation where you even if you had wanted to expand, you couldn't expand. So this was a very serious problem in the recession, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a reason why the recovery has been slow. Um, I don't know. I have. I think part of what you're saying, I would say, comes under the rubric of are we in the process of introducing all of these regulations, which corporate America complains about as well, they would be a disproportionate burden on small, obviously, because very large companies run whole offices to deal with handling these regulations, understanding them, and then addressing them. So clearly, the more, the higher the degree of regulation, the more the burden on small business. I think that's absolutely true. But I want to say one thing which has been a strength of the U.S. economy, certainly compared to the other advanced industrial countries, and that is that we do have in the U.S., we have much more vitality in terms of uh, when, when the economy is not in a great recession and struggling to recover in its normal state of affairs. We have much more vitality in terms of small business formation and small business exit. So there's a lot of movement in and out. And uh, we do have um, a, a culture which I think is reasonably entrepreneurial. I think, in a sense, part of your question was, you know, can business schools do more to promote that? But I think we, culturally speaking and historically speaking, we've done pretty well there as a country. I think it's a, I think business schools do. Uh, say over the past 20 years, certainly, and actually uh, Steve was very involved in this, I know at Rice, and he was very involved with it at London Business School and probably here, is basically programs in entrepreneurship. So we're trying to specialize programs or course material that actually gets at the formation of new entities, not just running, running large existing entities. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. We have time for one last question before we move on. So, Charlie, would you like to, can we get you a mic and... Uh... Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to ask Laura and the panel if Brad's suggestion for fixing Social Security mm -hmm. is to raise the age of retirement, isn't there a comparable fix for health care costs, which okay. is a tremendous problem mm -hmm. that 
we in the university is facing as well as the yeah. total economy. And that would be to change the incentive from to keep people well rather than reward mm -hmm. excellence in treating people once they get sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is better diet, mm -hmm. better nutrition. And I mm -hmm. think that could result a mm -hmm. simple change of incentive values, probably difficult to implement, <laughs> would be uh, a major impact in terms of reducing health care costs. So, Laura, your comments and then Brad's uh, reactions as well? Uh, I certainly think that's an important part of what needs to be done. I think we are much more certain, though. It's, it's, a, it's an act of arithmetic to sort of say, okay, if you increase the retirement age by one year or two year, what happens over the next 50 years to Social Security? Honestly, healthcare experts differ quite a lot on the cost savings from good health, good diets, they will disagree quite a lot. And then, of course, you have the other issue, which is, uh, and this goes to, so let's take another proposal, the proposal to have more um, health care savings accounts, okay, that people basically put in a savings account and then they use that only in emergency situations, okay. The, here, here are people who worry about that say the following. You will not use it to maintain your health when you should be maintaining your health. Mm -hmm. You will use it only when you're in a critical situation. And by the way, it will be insufficient because basically most of the big funding is done in, as you know, the last year of life. That doesn't matter whether you're old or young. You could be the last year of life very young, the mm -hmm. last year of life a motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of examples of, it's not about elderly here, it's basically about the last year of life. Those kinds of, the, the good health stuff doesn't get at those really big buckets of uh, spending. And then, let me just add one other one because this is, again, to show the, the issues of where, how, why it's so difficult to do healthcare debate. So in the US right now, we, we, we finance all of this research in biomedical, uh, in the biomedical area. We have the very best drug innovation mechanism in the entire world. We do not ask in that mechanism any place, is this cost effective? Is this drug cost effective? That is not a question that is asked by the researchers, by the drug companies, okay? So now you get, some, you get a new drug and it's judged to be effective, but no one asked the question of it's cost effective. Mm -hmm. Medicare, if it's judged to be effective, has to offer that drug. It is politically a matter of, at, at, there's a, a drug that came out recently where Medicare actually questioned the effectiveness, not the cost effectiveness of it. And right away, people said, oh, look what Medicare's doing. They're really trying to make sure this drug isn't used because the drug costs something like $100,000 a year for three months of life. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not taking a moral position on this or an ethical position. I'm just saying that this is the kind of problem. There are these massive, big problems. If we had an incentive structure which sort of said, from the beginning of the research to the time the drug gets to your table, the cost matters relative to its effectiveness, that would actually change the way we ask the question. So yes, there are huge incentive issues in, in, the, in the healthcare area, but it's, and it's so much easier to just say, two years on the social security age, we're fixed. <laughs> yeah, basically the solution with healthcare is, you know, die a year earlier, and that's, that's not quite as attractive <laughs> as to, <laughs> he, said, he said it very simply. <laughs> uh, not quite as attractive as retiring a year, a year there, late. I think there's still debate going on, maybe there's maybe a health care. There was certainly when we were in the process of uh, talking about um, the cost to society of smoking, the health care cost to society of smoking. But of course, it's not clear on a net basis that the cost of society of someone not smoking and living longer is lower than the cost of someone smoking and dying earlier. It's actually not clear. Yeah, it's, de okay? it's quite debated. It's quite it? debated. So I, I can see that the chancellor is uh, about to wrap us up, but uh, <laughs> Rob, you have a, a, one, a couple sentence comment on this? What, what popped into my mind when you asked your question was on the fiscal side, there was a proposal 
a long time ago of a negative income tax. So everyone pays in. If you're poor, you get money back, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the analogous thing here would be everyone pays into Medicare. If you do actions to stay well, you get a check, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I would get a yep. reward for starting swimming three mm -hmm. years ago, right? <laughs> and even if it was a nominal amount, it might make me feel might good, me feel mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, but this is an economist talking about incentives, which we love to do. <laughs> so, Chancellor, thank you very much for this, this opportunity. And, and Laura, we, we thank you. Thank and you. You've been a great uh, uh, help and inspiration to me as well. Uh, Laura hired me at London Business School, so obviously good good judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was delighted that he was coming to join Davis. Well, I have one question, so mm -hmm. not, if I may. Um, and I don't know whether you have an opinion about Baidol, but I have been talking about productivity in universities. Universities have been criticized broadly about their lack of productivity in this particular area. Mm -hmm. Do you have any opinions? I mean, Baidol is a, an act that was signed almost 30 years ago mm -hmm. to allow universities to own intellectual property. Right. And so um, do you have any idea, any, any opinions on that? I. I personally think we, uh, it's correct that uh, universities, uh, scholars, the university research largely funded by uh, the government at the basic level, that uh, the intellectual property that results from that, the go that the university should have a share of that. I think that the key thing in universities differ, and I don't know uh, how Davis handled this. Some universities are very good at moving uh, those ideas out into commercialization, and some are less good. So I would actually focus more on the interface, not, not the fact that the university has a legitimate claim on the intellectual property or some, some share of it, but on how you work effectively to get it out into the system. All right, I, um, I, I want to thank you all and thank our panel. I would like uh, to ask you to join me in a round of applause for them. Thank you. Thank you very much.